Was John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band really trying to copy Bruce Springsteen on hits like On the Dark Side from Eddie and the Cruisers? I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band have a brand new greatest hits. There'll be links at the very top of the description where you can pick it up. Before you answer the Springsteen question, I'm going to read you something. Uh, sure. And, and it's an interesting... It's a, I saw this comment from a, uh, on one of the boards uh, from a nuclear suit. He says, the Springsteen thing. I'm sorry, but I don't hear Br uh, Springsteen on Dark Side. I hear a band heavily influenced by the Jersey sound, which is a conglomeration of tons of styles, including soul, Motown, bar band, rock, and 50s pop rock, which... I get, I get what he's saying. What do you say when? Uh, what do you say concerning the Springsteen? Because that's never going to go away. Because that part, that's just going to be there. But what do you? How do you respond to that? Not that, not uh, the answer, but the Springsteen question. Well, uh, first of all, he he was very supportive of us. Um, used to back in the day, you know, used to come play with us all the time when we played down the Jersey Shore. Um, you know, we we. Uh, became friends with all the guys and all the bands, all the guys in the Jukes. In fact, our guitar player, Gary Gramolini, his younger brother, Joel Gramolini, was in the Jukes. He was he took uh, Stevie Van Zandt's place when Steve went to the E Street Band. And uh, so, I mean, there's a camaraderie there that uh, goes beyond what the press, you know, may or may not say about that relationship. And uh, Bruce was always very, very helpful with me as a songwriter. Um, obviously, you know, he uh, is a one in a uh, he's a one in a billion talent, you know, um, incredible, incredibly gifted songwriter and was so when he was very young. So he was um, he just, you know, helped me out with the thought process of it. And, you know, and we loved all the same records. You know, and he loved our band because, you know, we played the music that uh, we all grew up with, you know, like all the cover songs. And, and like I said, our songs were our original songs became colored with um, with our influences. And that's one of the things that uh, that those guys did down there as well. You know, um, Bruce did that with the East Street Band, Steve Van Zandt and Southside Johnny. You know, they colored their songs. This songs sound like Stax Volt songs, you know, like the old soul band songs, you know. And, and uh, you know, we wear our influence on our sleeves. I mean, we all grew up with uh, playing blues and stuff in, in early rock and roll. And, and, and the way that those traditions are passed on is like, you know, you listen to the records and you, you, you know, you, you learn what the guy did before you. You put your own spin on it. And then the guy waiting in line he hears what you did and then if you leave the breadcrumbs then that guy can follow through you back to the roots of what what uh, you learned you know um i i uh i just came back from doing a a, a benefit in, for saint jude's hospital and we did it in, in in the name of jimmy jameson who was a great friend of mine he was the lead singer of uh survivors for so many years and uh we were just good buddies we were on the same label and stuff and uh, they had it at the Hard Rock, and it's right at the end of Beale Street. And you look down Beale Street, and, you know, that's ground zero. I mean, that's, <laughs> like, where it all came together. It's just so small and so humble, but yet still, you can still see the magic of that street. That's where, you know, rock and roll started. I mean, that's where blues and country and soul music and rockabilly and all of that was coming out of every window you know and uh, i don't know if you saw the new elvis movie but uh I, I thought they did a great job of like sort of uh depicting beale street and how you know all of those influences all were just sort of coming out of all the windows you know and and just sort of turning into you know just the beautiful history of rock and roll that we have what was so I don't know if that answers your Bruce question, but no, it uh, does. It does. Well, I mean, the thing is, I I remember being a, schooled a little bit. I was in radio. I'd just gotten into radio around that time, and and I remember there was a uh, an announcer at the radio station. And he says, "You know, that's kind of that sound, though." He says, "You know, those guys mixed all those elements together, and when you do that, if you're doing it right, 
that's what it sounds like, you know, and he, and he would, I, I, and I, I was heavily into music back then, but I wasn't a journalist yet because I was just yeah, getting into yeah. radio or a historian in music. Um, so he kind of told, and he was much older than me. He says, that's kind of, that's what happens when you're from there and you mix all that together. And he kept saying, if you're doing it right, it's going to sound a variation of that or something like that. Uh, concerning well, his dark exercise. side, I mean, it, you know, when I hear dark side, um, you know, it's the most successful song that we've ever had. Um, probably not the best song I ever wrote, but uh, it just, uh, it, it, that song just, uh, it, it got on, it took the magic carpet ride, you know. Did you <laughs> know, just, by the way, did you know what after you're, you, okay, you guys are getting ready to record it. Did you have to present it to him first? How did that work as far as getting that song on the record? He wanted it. He told you the criteria. What happened after that? Well, I mean, I made a demo and I sent it down and uh, Marty Davidson really liked it and uh, liked the idea of it, you know, and, and it, uh, uh, you know, it had that old rock and roll sound. You know, when I when I hear that, I hear like the echo on the voice. And to me, that sounds like Sun Records, you know, like the early rockabilly Sun Records sound. And then when the band kicks in, I hear Mitch riding the Detroit wheels. I mean, that was my intention. Um it, you know, I love Mitch. I mean, done so many shows with him. You know, another great, great influence on my band. Um, and uh, so, you know, I made a demo and uh, they came up and they saw us play. And um, when we went in to record it, you know, I had only had one verse. You know, I, I, I only wrote one verse for it. And... Uh, so I said to Southside Johnny, I said, John, I only got one verse. I said, I keep trying to write a second verse, but, you know, just, uh, it just, I, I can't find it, you know. It doesn't sound right. He said, he goes, ah, sing the same verse twice. He goes, sing it once over the slow part and sing it over the, the fast part. And I said, can I do that? He goes, why not? It's a movie, you know. And we never thought we were making a hit record. I mean, we never thought that, you know, we, we thought we were making uh, songs for a movie with the hopes of uh, getting a record deal and and making our own album. You know, I mean, that's what I was thinking when we did it. It was, don't get me wrong, it was fun and it was exciting because, you know, we're a bar band. So if someone asked us to, you know, write songs for a motion picture, that's a very different kind of work than what we were used to doing. You know, we were used to writing songs to, to make people get out of their seats and dance and go buy beer at the bar. You know, it's like that's what we were used to. And, uh, you know, to write for a, a motion picture was very exciting to us and fun, you know. And uh, so, I mean, that's what we were thinking the whole time. You know, I remember we, we where tried I was. our best to make the best records we could and write the best songs we could. But we thought we still thought we were making songs for a movie. I, that to me that I remember where I was when I first heard the song. That's how it impacted me. And I and I always, whenever I interview someone, I I always make a point of wanting to tell them that, even though they've heard it, mo mo you know, hundreds of times. Huh. But I remember where I was. I was, you know, I I was in my pretend DJ booth, and the radio was on because I, you know, because I was practicing, and uh, it came on. I went, what the, heck? holy snap and turtles? What's that? You know, it's great. Um, <laughs> I, I might not have turtles. said holy yeah, snap and turtles. Song. I might not have said holy snap and turtles, but I'm saying it now. Anyway, <laughs> hey, I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to have more parts of this interview coming up. If you want to join our Patreon, you'll have early access to the entire interview, all the snippets, and even some extra stuff. If you want to pick up John Cafferty and Beaver Brown Band's brand new greatest hits, there's a link at the very top of the description. Make sure you share our videos. We love it when you share them on social media. And remember, we read all the comments. Subscribe to our video and like our videos as well. And the two Ps, remember, join our Patreon as mentioned. Or if you want to make a donation to the channel, there's a PayPal link at the very top of the description as well. I'm John Bowden. Take good care of yourself. This is Rock History Music.